Hello there, Jill here, and we're going to be looking now at course content for people who are looking to become a hypnotherapist and therefore looking at the different schools and the courses, and sometimes it can be overwhelming. I hope that the PDF that I sent and the previous video will have gone some way to help you structure how you question the questions that you ask yourself and the research that you can do. Now, I promised that I'd do something on course content and get down to the nitty gritty, and this is much better presented in a video because it would be quite a long PDF. Now, I could talk endlessly about course content, but that's not what we're here to do today. We're here today, or I'm here today, to just go through with you some real basics, some essentials that I think that any course should deliver to a hypnotherapist, somebody wanting to be a hypnotherapist, so that they can go out and they can be a safe, effective, and confident practitioner, yeah? And also that they can build a thriving practice because, you know, not just the social media and marketing efforts aside, that they get lots and lots of yummy referrals because people absolutely love what you do and they tell their friends and their family all about you. So, the points that I'm going to go over now, uh, it really reflect my practice over the last 19 years and what I see people coming to me for and my students, people, you know, what exactly are they coming for and how do we need to be equipped, what do we need to be equipped with to be that safe, effective and confident therapist. Well, the first thing is, is that it's not enough just to know a hypnotic technique. Because just like a cake recipe, there are many aspects to it. There's binding the butter and the sugar and whipping up the eggs. So it's no good just to have the eggs and know what you do with the eggs. It's no good trying to make a lasagna if you know how to make a ragu, a, a ragu but you don't know how to make a cheese sauce or work with the lasagna. You have to be able to bring together a whole pile of ingredients in order to have this yummy, layered, gorgeous dish. And it's exactly the same when you're training, okay? And when you're out there, be, when you're out there practicing as a hypnotherapist, you need a many different skills in order to be able to manage um, people who come to you with a whole variety of presenting conditions and, um, uh, and, and issues in order to be able to help them transform and move on in their lives. So the first thing I would say is that it, is, it really isn't enough just to have the, have the hypnosis skills. So you need something like the basis of a counselling practice. You need to know, we teach solutions to focus psychotherapy. It doesn't have to be that, but anything which teaches you how to build rapport, ask the right questions, assess whether somebody's ready for therapy, whether it's safe to give them therapy at that time, whether they need to defer it or whether you need to defer on. So you need to be able to have some sort of counselling practice where you really understand about rapport building. It's such a huge part of um, getting on with a client and a client really feeling heard. Everything around um, rapport and advanced listening and empathy building skills, reflective listening, all of that should be contained in any module that you do around the counselling, psychotherapy stuff. As I say, we do short-term solution focus work. Um, but within that, um, also a very um, careful assessment of how you go about assessing whether that client is ready for uh, and able and it's safe to, to work with them. Also, what I, we teach um, conversational hypnosis and there's a reason why we do that because if you learn just scripts, if you just, learn, if you just use scripts, it can be incredibly helpful yeah, to use scripts, especially if they're written by very talented people. So people who really understand hypnotic language, because you can learn so much from them. However, there's not one script, one generic script for smoking or 
um, public present presentations or getting rid of PTSD and trauma, helping someone out of addictions, etc, etc. It doesn't work like that because everybody is unique. And on your hypnosis journey, you will discover that hypno a lot of, a lot of um, uh, getting somebody into the hypnotic state is all about just managing their attention, just drawing in their attention. And you're going to talk differently to a 17 year old who's maybe come to you for help with you know, an early pregnancy and wanting to, and a bit frightened of the birth, to someone who's a 40 year old and just had IVF. You're going to talk to them differently. So it's exactly the same in your scripts and in the way that you induce hypnosis. Very important that you can be incredibly flexible around that. So I would suggest that you, even if you um, get taught just from scripts, that somewhere along the line you add in your ability to understand and piece together the different layers of hypnotic language so you can fly by the seat of your pants. And what I mean by that is that whatever situation, whatever kind of person comes to you, you have a set of skills that you can, you can actually use um, in different ways for different people and bring out the most um, perfect, meaningful um, hypnotic induction for that person. And so the next part of this is metaphor. Now we know that when you're working with hypnosis we are working with the subconscious mind where all the problems and barriers and um, negatively held beliefs are held. So it's not enough just to use willpower. And one of the things that really helps to kind of work with that area of the mind is metaphor, the use of metaphor and story. And I think it's an absolutely essential part of any training in hypnotherapy. Now, when we think of hypnosis, we will often think of telling of stories and use of metaphor in just that in just that in, in, instance. Get my teeth in in a minute. Um, but also, we know that hypnosis is happening all the time. It's the REM state, it's the theta state, and that happens when we're just talking as well. So important to be able to use your clients' metaphors, your clients' words, be able to really understand the power of metaphor just both in the interview and the, the chat part and the use of metaphor within hypnotic, hypnotic language. I also would suggest that an integrative approach is best for most people these days. We teach, you know, very scientifically based stuff. Um, we also teach the more holistic things around diet and nutrition. We teach about how food can affect your mood. We teach about our energy fields and how our thinking can impact not just ourselves but our client. We teach the basic um, part one of the emotional freedom technique. Now, that might not be right for you, but an integrative, holistic approach these days, um, I believe to be the best a way to equip yourself in a broad way to give yourself a, a much stronger foundation for helping people when you when you see them. Okay, so a lot of people who will come to see you will be people who have the foundations of their problems in an anxiety-based condition. So we can have right at the, the sort of base end of the scale, somebody who's a bit nervous about doing a public presentation or taking a test, an exam, you know, coming up a little bit, somebody who's got low self-esteem and just worried about, you know, have social anxiety, worry they're not good enough and stuff like that. Coming up to, you know, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety-based conditions of uh, many, many different types. And then we move into the sort of more serious mental health problems and psychosis and stuff like that. Now you're gonna be seeing this kind of like bottom two thirds, especially when you first start. Now, in order to be able to work with people on the anxiety scale, just having a hypnotic technique, uh, we teach the rewind technique, which is brilliant. Um, 
is fantastic for all of those, you know, it really does cover the whole plethora of, those, of that scale right the way up to people who've got post-traumatic stress disorder. The rewind technique is an amazing technique. So you want to make sure that any course that you do equips you with the hypnotic ability um, to, to deal with any uh, of these, you know, any, anybody on this scale. You know, it doesn't matter what you're using, what do, can you deal with people right from the very bottom, just a, a few nerves around a presentation, and can you deal with people right with, you know, with post-traumatic stress disorder or high, high anxiety conditions. So that's one thing I think is really important to check out with your school. We teach something called the rewind technique, and it's brilliant for helping, um, helping people all, you know, on that, you know, really high end on that scale. Um, however, it's also important, if we look at this integrative model, is that you are able to work with people just during the conversation, that you know things about food and breath work and just general lifestyles and, and, and what else people can do. Um, mindfulness, meditation, hypnosis when they're in between sessions. You need to know all the things that contribute to bringing down high anxiety conditions and especially if they're quite entrenched and have been there for a long time. The other thing that we see quite a lot is, a, is around addictions and dependencies. So again, asking your school if they do, if they work, if the work that you, if the training that they give you will be enough to deal with those um, people who've got those kind of problems. Anger, anger's another one, anger management stuff, um, sexual problems, will you be able to deal with that? Um, depression, some people say, some schools will say that you can't treat depression. We encourage it, we think that you know, with the right sets of skills, with the right hypnotic techniques, with the right counselling skills, there is no reason why you can't bring down the anxiety that causes a lot of depression. Uh, also around self-esteem, low self-esteem and confidence, again, will you be able to treat people with low self-esteem who, you know, worry, you know, constantly ruminating, worrying that they're not good enough and even when they're having a, you know, seemingly, you know, they're in a, a nice environment, they seem quite smiley, their internal dialogue is, oh, you're no good, oh, you shouldn't have worn this, oh, he's not interested in you, oh, she's not interested in you, and oh, my bum's too big in this, and, you know, has this real ruminating mind, and does your course, will your course enable you to help people with low self-esteem? Um, OCD, OCD comes in different formats, right from just simply just doing a bit too much checking to obsessive compulsive behavior that really takes over people's lives again will your course enable you to deal with people with OCD I want to add in here that very often these problems that I'm discussing here are led so you might get someone who feels really down who has a bit of OCD or feels really down and has um, anxiety and um, and a bit of yeah low self-esteem so you might have people who've got um, weight issues and anxiety and feel down so y y these aren't all going to be separate it's not as clean cut as that you know problems can be multi-layered and if they've been there for a long time they tend to kind of like chunk up as time goes on until of course they meet someone like you who's going to transform their lives um, also, it's very important with the increasing amount of um, people on the, um, on the spectrum, on the Asperger's autistic spectrum, that you understand about that and how you have to tailor your work, tailor your work differently when you're working with people on the scale. So it's being able to notice it, assess it, and how to manage and work with those people so that you can really um, put together a very good session. Also, what I would say is, does the, does the course enable you to look at ethics and boundaries around professional practice? Again, I could talk endlessly around ethics and boundaries, but you know, as a profession, 
it's really important that we act ethically. Um, if any of you want to kind of check up on some of the, um, if, if you're already in practice and you haven't covered that, um, the BACP, they've got a really great guidelines which we follow on ethics and boundaries for practitioners like, like ourselves. So the other area which is kind of like bound up a little bit with ethics and boundaries is self-care. You know, just doing that, um, uh, having the knowledge built into the course whereby you can assess yourself for readiness for practice. You can assess yourself, you can notice if your mindset's not quite right um, to go out there and be working with a certain type of person or, or just working generally. You can also notice where maybe, for instance, if you've got a little bit of low self-esteem, you know, that's highlighted in what you're learning so that you can go out and you can do something about it. Now, don't get me wrong, anybody who, everybody who practices isn't going to be Miss Perfect, okay? I'm not, you won't be. I get triggered. I'm not perfect. Things, you know, sometimes I'll have things go on for me. But the big thing is, is awareness because of my knowledge, the way that I've been taught, the way that I, I've grown and, and, and moved through this life. I have an awareness, a self-awareness um, from my skills that just let me know when it's okay, when I'm really kind of like, yeah, just riding the waves and doing really well. And other times when I need to just do a little bit of personal development work. So within the ethics and boundaries, there should always be that self-care program and that, and teaching you how to reflect on your, on your practice. So I think that's about it. Let me just make sure I've covered everything I wanted to do. Oh yeah, there's just one other thing which was around marketing. Now, not every school is, is going to be teaching you how to set up in practice. And that's not absolutely essential at all. It's really great and really useful if you can pick up a few tips. But some schools do teach it. And if they don't, you need to make provision so that by the end of the course, you're not going to have to go on another long course or do loads of research in order to be able to put your skills out there into community, doing good for your community and individuals. Start to learn the marketing stuff and you know how to set up a business and you know, the accounts and all the formalities and insurance and associations and all things like that. So yes, marketing and then the very practical knowledge of how to set up a successful how to set up a successful business. So hopefully um, that, was ha that was helpful to you. And um, if any of this is, there's more questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. It's Jill on 01273 738 663 or just email us at jill at within-site, S-I-G-H-T dot com. And we really look forward to hearing from you. Okay, bye.